Hello and welcome to the Visual Studio 2010 Unit Testing Webinar. My name is Ian Holdsworth and I am a consultant with Test House, the independent software testing specialists. We are an award winning software testing consultancy and also a Microsoft partner with offices in London, Madrid, Kerala, as well as the United States, Dubai and Saudi Arabia. We offer test guidance and process improvement as well as test management, manual and automated testing, application lifecycle management support from Agile all the way to CMMI. We support both functional and non-functional testing such as load testing and are dedicated to process improvement using Visual Studio 2010 and Team Foundation Server. Here we have a subset of our clients in the Middle East. Microsoft Visual Studio 2010 is a multifaceted development platform comprising not only support for Microsoft Team Foundation Server but also Microsoft Test Manager, Lab Management, Unit Testing, Performance and Load Testing, Coded UI Testing as well as many others. Over the next few months Test House will be pre presenting a series of training sessions and webinars on many of these aspects. Today I am primarily going to be concentrating on unit testing. Unit tests enable the extraction and isolation of the smallest testable piece of code within an application for the purpose of testing that it functions as it should and is fit for its purpose. Unit testing has been around since the earliest days of software development when the first functions had their first parameters. When the early programmers fresh from discovering the fire of machine code and learning the finesse of C realized that their functions and procedures needed a clinical and robust method of testing them. They knew they needed to write functions and procedures to test them. Then the renaissance of object oriented programming came with its classes, properties and methods and even more ways of abstracting methods and properties with drivers and stops. Now with Visual Studio 2010 and Team Foundation Server 2010. Not only can we easily create drivers and strubs, we can now incorporate our tests into the very build process itself, enabling build verification tests, gated check-in, and everything that is required for the continuous integration that is so vital to agile development. The primary purpose of unit testing is to reduce risk. The more well written and well thought out tests you have, the greater your risk reduction. Also, the smaller the section of code covered by any individual test, the better, as it reduces the scope for the highlighted defect, making the defect easier to locate. Drivers are the mainstay of unit testing, being the tests which call the methods and set the properties of our classes to ascertain if they are functioning correctly. Stumps are slightly more esoteric until you realize that all they really are are a mock version of our class method property which works alongside our driver in order to test the class which is calling our mock class. It is important 
to understand that when you write a test class, any class instantiated therein can be overridden, even its private members. As we can see here, the process of unit testing is almost always driven by a driver, which in turn interfaces with the object under test. This, in many cases, will be the extent of the test, as the driver will detect whether the object under test threw an exception and assert a failure, or not, as is appropriate. Don't forget that you are testing to make sure the object works correctly, and sometimes throwing an exception is the correct response. In addition to drivers, we also have stubs, also commonly referred to as mocks and fakes. The really important thing to understand about stubs is that they are not testing the code they are replacing, that but the code which is calling the code they are replacing. They are often driven by a driver, the exception being a class that has no exposed properties and its methods have no parameters or return values, which is very rare. Their purpose is to verify that properties and parameters of the calling code are correct. They are also used extensively to isolate code under test by creating mock-up code of the code we wish to exclude. Often this is done when only one method of a class is to be tested. The other methods and properties which are not going to be used can safely be overridden, even the private ones, with methods and properties which either return benign values or throw an exception. The latter is normally done for those methods and properties that should not be called during the test. Before I begin the demo, I feel it is important that I explain some of the attributes which are common to most tests. They are test class, class initialize, class cleanup, test method, test initialize, and test cleanup. The test class attribute identifies a class as a host for tests. Each method in the test class can have any one of a number of attributes. Class initialize is, as I'm sure most of you have guessed, called when the test class is initialized, and likewise class cleanup is called when the test class is disposed of. Test method identifies a method as a test with which will show you in the test view and make it available as a test in TFS and test manager. Test initialize attribute identifies that the method is to be called before every test is run, and likewise test cleanup is run when every test method is disposed of. Allow me to demonstrate. First, I'm going to load Visual Studio 2010. The class and project that I wish to test are already loaded. In this instance, the maths demo class. What we are going to do is we are going to create a unit test of the equals method and isolate the trig method. I right click on my maths demo class and click create unit test. I am now presented with the create unit test dialog. I'm going to unselect the methods I don't wish to test and before I click OK, I'm just going to quickly tell you about the settings and add assembly buttons. The add assembly simply allows us to add an additional assembly, should we want to, say, do integration testing and things like that. The settings button allows us to customise how our unit test code will be generated. I click the OK button and I'm asked 
for the name of the test project I wish my unit test to go into. In this instance I'm going to call it demo unit test. And click, click the create button. Notice we have now generated a second project, our demo unit test project, and in that project we have the maths demo test class. Now if we move down slightly and expand the additional test attributes, we should see that we have the class initialize, class cleanup, the test initialize, and test cleanup stubs all commented out but ready to use should we wish to create those particular test methods and their associated attributes. As we're not going to, I'll collapse that section now. Moving further down, we have our equals test with its test method attribute. On closer inspection, we see that we have generated co not only code to instantiate our maths demo class. But also, for each of the parameters of that method and its expected result. Notice also the assert inconclusive at the end, which is generated by default in order to remind us that we must actually customize this test otherwise it will always fail. As the first thing we want to do is isolate our equals method from the rest of the class the first thing we need to do is create a stub for our trig method. In order to do this I'm going to inherit the maths demo class and override it like so. Actually, I don't need the new attribute just there, so I shall get rid of that. I then modify my code to instantiate the inherited class rather than the original. the assert inconclusive from the end and add some default values for my parameters. In this instance let's say 2 and then set the operator to plus and then Two, and it should equal four. Now I right click on my test method and select run tests and as we can see our test is built, it's run and it's passed and if we have a quick look at the view test results we can see exactly how long it took, which machine it was on, and we could also add in other debugging information if we so wished in the test settings. However, as it is now finished, let's proceed. Now that we have written a simple unit test, Let's look at expanding our test by data driving it. Data driving enables us to expand our, our tests by exposing external data sources. We might run the same test method for each row in a data source, or we might have a data source which is a list of test methods we wish to run. We can even have a mixture of the both and build a test framework.
Supported data sources include comma separated variables, XML, and databases including Microsoft Access, Excel, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, and any OLEDB, ADO, or ODBC source. I will now demonstrate how to convert our existing unit test into an Excel data-driven one. Whilst I'm doing this, I will also demonstrate how to test for exceptions when we should actually be throwing an exception. OK, back in Visual Studio, I'm going to select the Test menu, Windows, and Test View. I'm then going to select equals, I'm going to right click and I'm going to set properties. I'm going to scroll up slightly on the properties window and I'm going to select data to connection string and I'm going to press the ellipses button. I'm now presented with the new test data source wizard. I select database Click Next. I'm now being asked for a data connection string. I'll click the New Connection button. Select Microsoft ODBC Data Source and click Continue. From the data source specification, select Use Connection String and click the Build button. Switch to the Machine Data Source and select Excel Files. Click OK. Now find the data file that you're going to use. In this instance, I have mathtest.xlfx. Click OK to open it. Click OK and then press Next in the wizard. Select the first sheet because we're going to be using the first sheet and click Finish. I'm now asked if I want to copy the spreadsheet into my project and make it a deployment item. Select Yes. Notice the data source attribute. Has now been added to our test method attribute. As I'm using an existing file I prepared earlier, I'll give you a quick run-through of the spreadsheet. Notice it's made up of five columns. The first three represent the parameters of the method that we are testing. The fourth column is the expected result, and the fifth column represents whether we are expecting that method to throw an e exception or not. Coming back to Visual Studio, we need to moderate, modify our generated variables to point to the data source rather than the constants that we defined earlier. like so. Notice we are now also bringing in the error and converting it to a boolean. Next we need 
let's modify our evaluation code to reflect the fact that we now need to detect when errors are thrown as correct in some circumstances. Notice how, if error is true, then we are expecting an error to be thrown. We are now wrapping our call to our method that we are testing in a try, catch, and finally group. And if we actually detect the error that we are looking for, We are capturing that information and then asserting if we didn't actually get an error. If we weren't expecting an error, then we are simply processing as we were before and asserting if they're not equal. This concludes the demo section. The fringe benefits of coded UI testing are that the code is easier to maintain, bug tracking is made easier because so many more bugs are actually automatically detected by your new tests, and code becomes self-documenting. We also have included some additional resources including two additional blogs, Visual Studio virtual machine that this demonstration was actually done on, the resources from this demo and the Microsoft Golf Community Twitter account and the Test House UK Twitter account. This concludes the demo. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them.